<clears throat> beautiful testimony from our choir. God restores. What do you say? I want to say words of apology to the family of Benita Williams. It should have been mentioned today that one of our members, Benita Williams, actually on the church roll was Benita Harris, and Benita Williams did pass away last week, and services for her will be Monday at the DuPont Park Church, where she was attending, and that will be at 11 with viewing at 10. So both tomorrow and Monday will be laying the rest members of our congregation. Okay, ushers, if we're ready, let's pass out the handout for today's sermon. To our online viewers, the handout is available for you online. And then if we have folk today in the balcony or in the congregation here on the main floor who did not get a notebook, raise your hand. Where were we all last Sabbath when we gave out all these notebooks? Church was packed last Sabbath. So the ushers will just take a moment, give you your notebook, give you your handout. Again, my suggestion is that you put your name and your phone number on the notebook so that if you leave it in church, leave it in the pew, we can call you and say that we have your notebook. Make sure uh, ushers at the balcony are served as well with notebooks and with the handout. The handout is entitled, The Touch of God in the Book of Revelation. Next week, the handout will be entitled, The Sevens of Revelation. I really appreciated that song, God Restores. Beautiful. Just keep your held hand high, wave it. We've got some folk right in the middle who are being very stubborn not ashamed to disturb the whole church till they get their notebook and their handout. Did I say Monday? Thank you. The funeral for Sister Williams is on Tuesday, not Monday. Tuesday. Thank you, Elder Armstrong. Tuesday. Viewing at 10, funeral at 11 at DuPont Park Church. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation 1.17. I appreciate how young Brother Paul handled that. Well done. Revelation 1 and verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But then what did he do? Talk to me, church family. What did he do? He touched me. He touched me. Saying, to me, 
do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. He touched me. He laid his hand on me. And then he said, having laid his hand on me, what did he say? In my sermon for the first service, I emphasized under the title, What Jesus Said. I talked about the proper response to the book, which is that Jesus is talking and teaching in the book. And the lesson in the first service was, to him that hears and reads, he must keep. But in today's sermon, my good friends watching in, pastor's going to talk about the personal aura, ambiance, atmosphere of the book of Revelation. I want you to leave today knowing that the book is really to you. When I saw him, I felt that his feet is dead. What did he do? Come on, y'all. What did he do? He laid his hand on me. And note the right hand, the hand of power. Not to insult the left-handed people, but in the Bible, the right hand. It's all right, you're fine. But in the Bible parlance, the right hand is the hand of what? Power and restoration. That song, he restores, my, my. He put the hand of power on me. He touched me, Angela, with his hand of power. And then having touched me, what did he do next? He talked to me. I mean, that's pretty personal, isn't it? I mean, think of people you know and and intimate conversations, and when someone touches you and talks to you, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty special. In fact, you don't want just anybody talking to you and touching you at the same time. I thought I would just work that in, even though it's not in the notes. Now you watch who talks to you and touch you at the same time. You can just, you know, hey, hey, hold on here. Talk, but don't touch. <laughs> but there's something personal going on here. I'm going to take my time with this, because I've got to build it in your mind. There's something, there's something special going on. That, that this old man, he's 90 years old, and he's on this rock, breaking rock all day long, separated from those that he knows. He's in the spirit on the Lord's day. He finds some cave, some hovel, some peak to worship. And suddenly there are these sounds like thunder. He's old, he's not seen Jesus for years, and it's been almost 70 years. And this is jarring and unnerving, and what's going on here? And, 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 and Jesus is so personal. See, Jesus is personal with us, and understanding his, his situation, Christ comes out of the aura of the vision and, 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 and makes himself real that there's no longer virtuality here. This is, this is actuality. And, and Jesus moves toward him, and he can feel the hand of God on him. And then he talks to him. Calms the old man down. Now, you will appreciate this more when pastor gets into the really gets into this book, but we're just getting started with this book. And, and, and because there, there, there are going to be other times when, 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 when John faints, the, the visions are so powerful, the information, uh, Trevor, is so overwhelming that John faints. And, but, but, but now he, he can get through it, King, because, because Jesus has touched him and he knows that Christ is right there with him. Would it to God that in your moments of trial, would to God in your moments of fear, that you actually could feel the hand of God. Yes. To know in that moment, 
Antoinette, that is real. That your loneliness, your fear is, is, is not something that, that, is, that is distanced from heaven and earth. That, that Christ is right there with you. And he promised it. He said, lo, I am with you all the way, even to the end. Didn't he say it? Yeah. Well, jump to the end of the book. Revelation 21. I want you to see how this this personal presence and touch of God surrounds the book. Revelation 21. Revelation 22, rather. 22. And verse 10. Revelation 22 and verse 10. You see it? Come on, let's read. And he said to me, he said to what? Now, this is the end of the book, folk. See, what I want you to get to see is that once Christ shows up in the revelatory experience, Nicole, then Christ stays with him throughout the vision process. Ah, oh, y'all way too calm for me. It's not Christ just throwing out this. He, he's right there with John. So now it's at the end, Brother Otley. He's almost done, and he says, and he said to me, so Christ is still right there with him, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is at hand. So from the beginning of Revelation to the last chapter, Jesus is right there nurturing, nurturing John through the process. Now let me talk to you. You see, we made the point last week in our, in our, in our teaching and instruction that, 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 that this, 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 this revelation book is, is God. One of the things that the revelation book teaches is that God wants to reveal himself to you. You remember I made that point? At the end of the sermon, I, I even made the appeal. I made the appeal that your hearts will be prepared to receive God's revelation. Do you remember that point? So I'm trying to get you to see here is that, is that, that God wants to do the same thing for you. God wants to gently lead you through your life experience, assuring you all along the way, my friend, that he's with you. Because sometimes, hear me, sometimes the process of knowing God gets troublesome and anxious and, and, and fearsome, and God wants you to know, I don't care how bad it gets, I have one goal to make myself known to you, and I'm so involved in it, I'm sticking right with you through the whole process. In fact, let me just say it in a simple sentence in case you've forgotten this truth. A Christian is never by himself. Ah, that's a pitiful amen. I, I, don't think, I don't think your guardian angel was impressed with that. You cannot get through a day without the living, abiding presence of God. Helps you drive when you're trying to drive and text at the same time. That angel says, this poor fool, poor fool, let me get him home. You know you shouldn't be doing it. Angel takes over the wheel. You don't know it. You don't know how many accidents you miss while you text and drive at the same time. But you're, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. Even... When you're driving to some place where you have no business, come on and give God glory right now. Driving, we have no business. God is with you. See, 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 God sticks with you, sticks with you. you have, he has to stick with you or you couldn't drink the beer. Woo, he didn't say that, did he? Yes, he did. He sure did. He, he just said that right in the pulpit. He said it in the pulpit. He said it. Because the Bible says, in him we move and breathe and have our being. You can't sin without God's support. Yeah, now chew on that one. You folks watching, you, yeah, you look that up. Look that up. That's, yeah. My point simply is this, that the revelation of God is a personal thing. So we learned, get into the sermon, Henry, we learned the book is directed from Christ. We learn the book is given to the church under persecution. We learn 
It is disguised in symbols to preserve the message. I like that part. Remember that last week? We told you why the book has all these crazy animals and, and signals. Remember that? So that the Roman soldiers wouldn't know that truth was going right by them. Oh, boy. God is sly. <laughs> Fool them, soldiers. They saw the stuff. This is junk. The man has lost his mind. He's got hornets with, 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 with people's faces. Send them off the island. But before it got to the churches, the Lord had given the church the Old Testament, and so all the keys to the symbols, the church already had it. All right, that's last week's sermon. So we learned all these things. Now, now, then we learned that God wants to reveal himself not just to John, but to each of us. The personal touch of the book. Go to the Gospel of John, the first chapter, verses 35 through 42. Can't read them, but just go there. Maybe put a star by it, a circle by it, or put it in your notes. John 1, 35 to 42. Let's build the, let's build the case now. Let's build the case. John, according to his testimony in his own gospel, was one of the first two disciples. In fact, the first two disciples of Jesus were Andrew and John. He's called the other disciple. John's too modest to call his own name. He's the other disciple. And so, from the earth, and, 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 and they meet him, they meet him while John the Baptist is preaching. They're there. John actually witnesses the baptism of Jesus. So the point I'm making, Taft, is that John the Apostle, as a young man, we, we think that John was about 17 or 18 when he met Jesus. Here's the one disciple who was with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry to the end. To the end. In fact, in John 19 and verses 25 through 27, you see John right there at the cross. He's the only disciple at the cross. So not only did he witness Christ's ministry from the beginning to the, uh, to the end, he was involved with Jesus in his most intimate and difficult struggles. John was there. John was there. So what is going on here? Let me talk to you about you. See, the minute you were born, Jesus took a personal interest in you. Knows your mama, your daddy, your grandparents. He knows that some of your relatives are crazy. He knows that. Oh, yeah, he knows that. He knows you got genes that are unpredictable. Yeah. yeah. Odd people who've done odd things in your history. Some of us have murderers in our ancestry. Prostitutes? Why are y'all sitting there all pious? Robbers and thieves, liars, gangsters? Yeah. I, I, I say to anybody, don't, don't, don't trace your family tree back too far. You're going to be embarrassed. At some point, you're going to say, oh, Lord, have mercy. But in that tracing, you find out why you are the way you are. Because everybody sitting here has oddness. I tell the young ladies who are dating a young man, you see a young man, you, you're dating him, he's... Wait till you meet his daddy. It all comes down. I'm building you somewhere now. So the Lord knows when you were born, he's got a lot of work to do. Turn to somebody and say right now, he's working on me. Yes, sir, he is. He's working on me. The Lord looked at John and said, we got some serious work to do here. According to Mark 3 and verse 17, he was a troubled and troublesome young man. Remember, he and his brother were called the sons of thunder. The Greek says 
the sons of trouble. John and James, and they're mentioned all the time, they're always doing something. My remember me and my brother, me and Bill, Henry and Bill, Henry and Bill. Now, you don't need to know my whole story because you can't handle it, but Henry and Bill, <laughs> we were a pair, me and my brother. Do anything, mischief. I tell you one thing I used to enjoy to do, I'll tell you this. You remember, some of you remember the trolleys? Trolleys with the things going up on the wires of head. You want to have some fun. Run up behind that thing when it stops to pick up somebody and pull the things off the lines. And then watch the driver press down, ain't no power. <laughs> Henry and Bill. I remember one time we did it, one time we did it, and we didn't know. I don't, I don't know where the guy was. I could run. I was fast, fastest man in my school for years. And, 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 and we, we did it. And I guess, I guess the bus driver was a former track star or something. That, 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 brother, that brother came off that bus. Now, folks, I could put, pick him up and put him down. Nobody could outrun me. This brother was catching me from behind. Now, I'm about 16 years old. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm blasting through the, through the courtyards and through the, through the, through the, uh, through the houses. Uh, he's, he's catching me. Now, I have done wrong, and I'm saying, Lord, have mercy upon me. But I knew the neighborhood better need that I ducked. He, I lost him. What I'm saying is, James and John are like Henry and Bill, always doing something they had no business. Now, here's what you ought to be thankful for. There's nothing you've ever done in your life that has discouraged Jesus about saving you. Yes, sir. Woo! You can be a card-carrying, certified, bona fide nut, and God will still plead to the Father, I died for him, I will save him. So what the book of Revelation is saying to me, Carla, is that when God, when Jesus met John, he said, here's a special work. I'm going to hang in with him. He's a son of thunder. I'm going to work with him until I get him where he needs to be. He was a fisherman. Now, you know fisherman. He was a sailor. He was a cursing, swearing, hard-hitting, hard-drinking. Are you listening to me? And he's called, no wonder Jesus called him first. <laughs> it was going to take longer, <laughs> hey, come on somebody, to save John than anybody. I'm trying to get you to see that when you see this man receiving the revelation, that's the result of a whole lot of Holy Ghost work. And when you stand on the sea of glass and look in those reflecting walls and see your face, you're going to know there's a God somewhere. I made it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So God is working with him. <laughs> He's a fisherman. Luke 9, 51 through 56. Man, let's, let's go there. Let's go there. Luke 9. This is really a shame for somebody to be like this, calling himself a Christian. He was a disciple of Jesus. In Luke 9, verse 51. Look at this foolishness. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, this is toward the end, this is toward the end of his ministry. He'd been working with John for three years. And as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Samaritans didn't want to receive Jesus. He was on his way to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, who's the next names you see? Bill and Henry. Here's Bill and Henry. <laughs> and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire? These are church members. These are elders. We got to watch some elders, Trevor. These are elders. Lead us in the church. Here it is. You want us to call command fire to come down from heaven and consume them as Elijah did. They even refer to the prophet. Look at verse 255. But he, that is Jesus, turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. 
Their names are on the church roll. They're attending Sabbath every church every Sabbath. Don't be discouraged with yourself, folk. I know you're still messing up. Been in the church for 55 years, still messing up. That's all right. My God is a patient, working God. Day by day, month by month. Yeah! By your God keeps working on you and bringing you to your knees. He's going to save you in spite of you. And this is at the end of Christ's ministry. Mark 9, 38 through 41 is another incident. His brother was healing, doing some healing. And James and John, there they are again, Bill and Henry, said, Jesus, we, we, don't, we don't know these people. What are they doing healing? Well, Jesus said, well, they're healing. But we, we don't know them, but they're healing. Leave them alone. Controlling and possessing, like some folk in the church. And they just got baptized. We can't make them a deacon or a deaconess. Maybe they can usher a bit. Wait till they prove themselves. Now, you ain't proved yourself. Wait till they prove themselves. Come on, somebody. We have these levels, and, 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 and it comes out of our own, our own self-picture. It's a false picture. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the thief on the cross who never kept a Sabbath or paid any tithe is going to enjoy the same heaven you go into with your tithe, paying, chopped and eating, Sabbath-keeping self. Doesn't make God any difference. If you love God, he's going to save you. Are you enjoying the sermon so far? I am. So here they are, possessive, troubled, fishermen, vengeful. Oh, and then here's one. Here's one. Mark 10. Mark 10. Let's read that one. I tell you, some people, some church members got more nerve. Mark 10. I don't have time to get there. Again, it's toward the end of the ministry. They feel that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. So James and John, Bill and Henry, they go to their mama this time. Look, Mama, we need you to go talk to him. Well, boys, what's what? When he gets to his kingdom, I want to be on this side. And I want you to be on this side. Me, James here, John there. How's that sound, Mama? Well, okay. So here they come, trooping in. And if you read Luke, they show up at the communion service with these plans. Most pious service in the church, here they come, with ambition. Unholy ambition. And the thing, of course, creates all kind of confusion. The disciples are mad now. They can hardly take the bread and drink the juice. What's in the Bible, y'all? I'm not making this up. Luke 22, read the whole story. They can't worship. Upset because these two folk come in. One wants to be first elder, other wants to be assistant pastor. This is the man to whom God is going to give the revelation. Are y'all listening to my sermon? <laughs> Pastor Joseph, I want the saints to see today that the Lord we serve is a patient, working God. And even when he hasn't gotten all of the stuff out of you that ought to be out of you, he just keeps working. That's never write somebody off in the church. Don't decide because somebody's not coming because they've gotten four or five marriages and they're walking in church with five kids but five different men. Don't you decide they cannot be saved. God is a specialist in salvation. Just when you count that brother out, hey, God brings him where he needs to be. Don't stop praying for them kids. Don't stop praying for those folks. Don't come back to church. Don't decide because you hear something about somebody, they're not going to make it in. I done read my Bible. The text says the first shall be last. Hey, and the last shall be first. He's working on John. He's getting John ready. 
because it's going to get rough for John. The hour of age is 292. He was the youngest disciple. The hour of age is 139. He was a person of earnest and deep conviction. Everybody's got a good side. Everybody's got a bad side. Don't get so wrapped up in somebody's bad side that you forget your bad side. I will know that me and the pastors and the Tacoma Park Church, I will know we have reached a level of salvation when this becomes a congregation where there is never any gossip about anybody. that you're ready to go into the kingdom will be when the gossip starts you. I don't want to hear that. See, folks, it takes two people to gossip. Gossips don't talk to chairs. They talk to people. So if you won't listen, it's over. Did anybody hear what I just said? Freeze, not in the notes. Just toss it in, Holy Ghost. So my point simply is this. The Lord now is working on this brother getting him ready. How did Jesus do it? Matthew 10, 1 through 4. How did he get John ready? I'm almost done. How did he get John ready? What did he do? Because John was a piece of work, just like some of us. Piece of work. Hypocritical, ambitious, angry, backbiting, judgmental. See, that's why the Lord brings you in the church. I've been trying to get people to see for years the church is not a society of Christians. The church is a hospital. I've been saying it for years. And I've noticed this about hospitals. When you visit the hospital, you don't hear the cancer patients gossiping about the heart patients. You know why? Because the cancer patients are too sick. Some of you caught it. Some of you didn't get it. Some of, it went right by some of you. The cancer patient is too concerned about staying alive. He has no time to talk about a heart patient. Hey, somebody say amen out there. When you finally, finally accept your own condition, you don't have time to discuss Pastor Wright's condition. You're just so concerned that you're going to make it in yourself. The Lord's trying to get us ready. He's going to send all kinds of people into these pews. Crazy hair dudes, skirts too short. And some of us, I don't know what it is, some of us die. Somebody wears a short shirt, some of us just die. Ah! <laughs> like a long skirt is a pathway to glory. <laughs> there may be more evil going on underneath a, short, a long skirt than a short skirt. I meant to say it just like that. Somebody say amen. amen. So this business we have of judging folks, somebody walks in, they got a lot of stuff on, both dangles and this and that, so forth, and holes here and there, and lips and so forth. And so forth. Hey, 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 just, just be good. They came to church. Just shut up. Let them sit down. Amen. Now, we got to get ready. The Lord's going to send them. Come in, they sing too loud. They're going to act right. Won't stand up when we stand up. Won't know how to kneel. Yeah, he's going to send them right in here. Don't, don't, don't Bible, they have the Bible upside down when what's going on. That's all right. Sit next to that person all messed up. Show them which way to hold the Bible. Look right by all that jewelry. Amens are weak, but I'm going to keep on preaching. Look right by that jewelry. No matter they sm smoke on their breath, that's all right. They brought their smoky breath to church. Let the Lord clean them up. Shut your mouth up and serve the God of the Lord. And the Lord was tired. He was tired of John. He was tired of John. So he said, I will expose myself to John, Matthew 10, 1 through 4. I'll call him with the disciples. And he changed, watch it, he changed John by exposing John to himself. That's how he's going to change you, by exposing you to himself. And you become mollified and softened and subdued 
by the presence of a holy God and all that evilness and self-contentment and self it, it oozes out of you and you woke up one day, you're not the same as you were before. Revelation is a personal book. God working with this young man to bring him around. He saw Jesus perform miracles. Heard all of Jesus' sermons. Saw Jesus go through personal chastisement and keep his mouth shut. He was a good person with a lot of bad stuff. He represents the human race. John had a destiny. And so do you. So he winds up in a pot of boiling oil. Peter's dead. His brother James was beheaded. His running buddy. Matthew's lost in India somewhere. Doubting Thomas also somewhere in India lost. They lost track completely of Simon the Zealot. Nobody to talk to. Nobody who remembers Jesus but him. Nobody was an eyewitness but him. That's why he starts the first book of John with the words, that that we have heard, that that we have seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears. He's reminiscing. And handled with our hands, he says to the church, I commend unto you the Jesus that I touched and that touched me. But it's been years now, 60. And his bones are aching. His muscles are tired. <coughs> One piece I read about Patmos, they would wake the men up four or five in the morning, feed them a little grain pulse with water. They started cracking rock before dawn. He's 90 years old. Some men would have heart attacks, the research I did, while cracking rocks on Patmos. Rise that morning and be buried that evening. Where does a 90-year-old man get the strength? He's full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Where does a 90-year-old man find the perseverance? Jesus is all in his heart. Maybe I'm too emotional, but I see him that Sabbath morning weeping. If he could just hear the saints of God sing a song. If he could just hear somebody pray a prayer. Maybe somebody preach a sermon. And then all of a sudden, he hears this voice like many waters. Thunder, the Bible says. And something inside of John begins to tingle. He recognizes that voice as the same voice that spoke to the winds that were, that were blowing and tossing and, and about to turn the ship over. That's the same voice that stood up, raised his hands and said, Peace be still. But the Greek is sharper. The Greek says, he said, Shut up! Shut up! John says, that's that same voice that said to the wind, Shut up! Jesus is here with me! He turns. He says, I turned and I saw him standing between the golden candlesticks, but he couldn't touch him. He couldn't reach him. The vision separated from John. He, 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 can't, he can't get to him. And, and, and Jesus understands sometimes when I'm praying, I need more than a verse. I need more than a verse. I need the touch of God. Jesus having told him, I'm the Alpha, the Omega. Write these things. then without even John's invitation moves over to John lays his hand on him 
Because John had fallen down on his face. And Jesus, remember, Jesus remembers this is the man that I trusted so much I put in charge of my mama. I ain't going to just talk to John. I'm going to touch him. I'm going to touch him. This book is personal. And as you read this book through for the first or second or third or hundredth time, look for the touch of Jesus. Shackled by a heavy burden Neath a load of guilt and shame Then the word of Jesus touched me Sing it with me. Hallelujah. Oh, he touched me. Lift it up, saints. And all the joy that floods my soul for something happened and now Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In those days, I was very shy. You couldn't pay me to get up in front of anybody and say anything. Couldn't find a job, so I went down to Winston-Salem, North Carolina to work in a tent meeting with Elder J. Malcolm Phipps. My grandmother was there. Dad said, well, you'll take care of him out of trouble. Remember Bill and Henry. So I went down. And that summer, I was going to be an engineer at a scholarship at Cincinnati U on the MIT. Smart as a whip, fast of foot, the king of stupid. And I watched during that summer people flock to hear from the man of God truths I'd known all my life and taken lightly. That summer, he touched me. I've never been the same. Preaching. <laughs> I said, laugh at preachers. back row of the church, spitballs at girls in church, man preaching. Remember Bill and Henry, we would, we would spit them back and forth toward each other. Man's preaching. He touched me. And all I'm saying to you is this, the book of Revelation is not just a bunch of prophecies. The book of Revelation is God's reach toward your sorry life. I was in the church unsaved, in the church unconverted. Truth in my head, no truth in my heart. Like a lot of young people that attend this church, just going through the motions. Mom and dad's house, you got to go. So I sit in the back and act a fool. But the Lord looks at you 
and he says, I got something there I need to do. Never saw myself. I mean, folks, at the General Conference in 1985, Henry Wright stood in the Superdome and preached to 50,000 people. touch me. What he wants to do is get by the you that is your enemy and find in you what he died for. And I'm begging you to move from a policy and a pretense in the church and become what John became for Jesus, a person to whom he could trust the revelation. music, Anwar. Since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me you to just make contact with me. Accept the fact that whatever you're going through, God has not forsaken. He wants you to feel his presence. Perhaps there's somebody here. You've been thinking about it. Listen to me. You've been thinking about really giving yourself to Jesus. Really. Maybe you're ready for baptism, maybe for Bible study. And you want to make a decision today. No cards. I want you to come down, balcony, any section, just come down front. Make a public decision in response to the touch of God. Church, you're praying. Let's see if somebody comes. Let's sing the song again. You can come anytime. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. Somebody will come. to our prayer meeting. She's not a member of the church. Today she makes her decision. God bless you, Shannon. Somebody else will come. Somebody else will come. Oh, don't let this go by. I beg you, don't let this go by. God's got to be talking to somebody else besides 
this dear young lady. Please come. Oh Lord, please come. Please come. I know it's I know it's I know it's kind of imposing to come down this way, but hey. Hey, Lord, cross for you. Would you come? Daniels, Pastor Coldsley, Joseph, you see anybody come down, you greet them with my eyes are closed. Come on down. Let's pray. Just slip out and come. Father, we've seen the book of Revelation today in a different light. Not just some imposing prophetic document. It is a loving God who has spent years drawing a young man who's now 90 years old into his bosom and to let John know that Christ finally approves <laughs> that John's journey has not been in vain Jesus leaves heaven and in time that we cannot measure in human calculation zips through Orion and stands on the top of Patmos so he can put his hand on his servant. I'm deeply moved by that, Lord. I'm deeply moved by that. It's going to be all right, John. And you said that same thing to my wicked heart. It's going to be all right. To every heart here, it's going to be all right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let the church say amen. You may be seated. Are you glad you came to church today? Now, next week, Pastor Jeff and I are excited. It'll be the church in Ephesus. Oh, man. Got some good stuff for you start with the seven churches so you need your notepad already I got a handout for you breaking down the churches the messages how they're how they're uh, described how they're broken down how they're shaped it's gonna be good stuff see you next Sabbath what do you say <laughs>